When you think of a villain, especially a villain in the Command & Conquer series, generally your mind goes to Kane. See that man just bathed in red light, the crazy coat he's got on. He really emanates the power of a villain, doesn't he? But truly, it's not the fact that he's a fanatical cult leader. It's not the fact that he's a murderous crazy man or his drip. He's evil because he's bald. And that's why you need my sponsor, Keeps. Did you know two out of three men will experience some form of male power and baldness in their time? In fact, sometimes very early on. And the most important thing to do is to make sure that you are preventative. And with Keeps, you can make sure that you do not become a villain like our boy Kane here, despite this fantastic drip. And I've sung the praise of Keeps pretty often because the company seemed great, the products seemed great, and the reviews were wonderful. And just about a month ago, I decided to take the plunge into it myself. I mean, I'm pretty happy with where my hair is at right now, but I noticed, you know, there's a little, there's a little bit here and there, and I'm like, hey, you know, the point is preventative anyway, so... Here I am with it. It takes a few months to really settle in, but that's kind of the point. If nothing changes, that I'm doing it right. And I felt that considering how much I advertise this product, I should be definitely taking more of a chance to use it and not just rely on other reviews. So with that being said, you can go down in the description and go to keeps.com slash bricky to get 50% off your first order. Once again, it's in the description, keeps.com slash bricky. Do not be like Kane, he's a very bad man. And with that being said, thank you for sponsoring this video. And let's talk about zone raiders. Hello everyone, my name is Bricky, currently experiencing crippling insomnia from hearing missile squad ready for combat in my every waking nightmares listen strategy games they're hard they're hard from both a technical and big brain point of view having a good apm while micromanaging units buildings production queues and whatever the hell your opponent is doing takes a lot of skill and you know who always has had a skill issue this guy bricky have skill issue hard thing make bricky scared bricky allergic to hard thing you go near hard thing and go <clears throat> But for some reason, my parents thought it was a good idea to buy me StarCraft Brood War when I was a really young kid, and god damn it, did I have a good time with it. So young RTS player Bricky decided to keep that train rolling, jumped onto the Command and Conquer series with Command and Conquer 3, and fell in love. And from there, I mean, StarCraft is a very popular RTS game, arguably the most popular RTS game out there, but it is not my favorite. That title goes to Command and Conquer 3, Kane's Wrath. Kane's Wrath is just a gem. It is graduated from the goat straight to moose. Command and Conquer 3, oh my God, what a game. Made with so much love, so much care, so much, so much polish. When fun was at the forefront, and it was made by EA, so sales figures were there, but the and I mean, you know me. Well, okay, maybe some of you don't know me. For those who don't know me, hi, I'm Bricky. I make video. But besides that, you know I just jump around from topics. I just bounce around talking about what the hell I want to talk about. So I felt like talking about Command & Conquer 3, Kane's Wrath, because it's a goddamn amazing RTS game. Okay, fuck you. I wish there was a way to know you're in the good old days before you've actually left them. So Command & Conquer 3 is a long-running RTS series, or was long-running. <laughs> Fuck you, EA. There was Generals, Red Alert, Tiberium Wars, just many types of Command & Conquer games that spanned very many genres and how they played. Now, being 26, I didn't really get into Generals very much, and I didn't really get into Red Alert until Red Alert 3 came out. And even that, I mean, Command & Conquer Tiberium Sun was the prequel to Tiberium Wars, and that came out way, way, way back when. So I got really big into Command & Conquer 3 Tiberium Wars when it came out. And jumping into that game, I I was a little surprised, especially as a younger kid with the campaign, because you know, RTS campaigns are a little hit or miss, and this one was a little hit or miss with its camp and its insane amounts of cheese, but it took some genuine issues? What are you doing? He's defenseless! He's the enemy! Okay, so for starters, all of the actual like live action acting and stuff for all these games are border between being somewhat decent to being passable to being absolute crap. It just depended on what mission you were on. The script was all over the place. The sets were funny, you know, but at the same time, there was so much charm to it that it was acceptable. I'm escaping to the one place that hasn't been corrupted by capitalism. Space! I want you to look at Senator Armstrong. 
of Metal Gear Rising, all right? In terms of story, Armstrong being the final villain is like the dumbest thing on the planet. He was barely set up at all, mentioned like once, and then just arrives like a 20 minute cutscene. It's It's honestly pretty awful writing, but it's so fucking funny and charming that you don't give a shit because it's because it's Nano Machine Man. I kind of get that feeling a little bit, except the game deals with some pretty specific and highly political issues. Okay, I'm getting ahead of myself. Tiberium Wars is a sequel to Tiberium Sun that came out in the 1990s. The third game follows the third Tiberium War. Tiberium is a mysterious alien substance that crash landed on Earth. This was sometime in the 1990s and it began terraforming the landscape. It would constantly mutate the local flora and fauna and overall just spread pretty rapidly and it was generally dangerous and toxic to humans however it was also a very potent fuel source a very powerful resource so despite the obvious dangers of toxic gas massive human mutation this becoming such a major resource and how much it was spreading across the planet made it very sought after in the 2040s about 50 years later this is when our two major factions are fighting the global defense initiative or gdi is the general law and order kind of group they're an amalgamation of a ton of countries all coming together with the the pretty standard like american looking law and order and and strength in terms of military might kind of group they're trying to combat the spread of the crystals and generally protect everybody and keep everyone all huddled together in these nice safe zones and they're fighting the brotherhood of nod the brotherhood of nod believe that the crystals are serving as humanity's next evolution that the use and mutation etc of tiberium is what will bring people up up into, I don't know, some kind of like massive new livelihood. You know how that kind of people go. When they are led by their very, very smooth leader, Kane. The world is generally collapsed altogether and any kind of national border has been removed or assimilated and now the entire world is ran into zones. You've got blue zones, yellow zones, and red zones. Blue zones are life as we generally know it, almost free of any kind of Tiberium and the GDI take up almost the entirety of the blue zones. The yellow zones have light Tiberium exposure. It's around here and there. It's generally demilitarized, very well, you know, scavenger-like, and Nod takes up most of these areas. Red zones are nearly uninhabitable. Nod has some of these as well, but generally if you're in a red zone, you, you just can't live there. See, these cutting up of zones is generally where the overall fighting between GDI and Nod take place. Because to the Brotherhood of Nod, they see GDI as the oppressors. They have gone out and taken all of the habitable blue zones, all of the areas that are the safest, and they have shoved everyone else out. GDI are forcing the impoverished and the unworthy out of the safe zones into the scavenger wastelands. This generally creates anger and animosity to the people pushed out by GDI and have them go directly to the direct opposition, the fanatical terrorist group, Brotherhood of Nod. Because when you and your family have been pushed out of a safe zone to scavenge for yourself, joining a fanatical group to tear down the oppressors is not that far from an understandable course of action. Oh yeah, there's also the Skrin too. That's like the Tiberium aliens. They just kind of show up at the end. I mean, they have their own lore and stuff, but honestly, it's not as interesting to me. They're really cool looking, but they're just like, hey, here's your third faction. You know, looking back at it, it's really nice when a game genuinely has a political theme going on with it. And I mean like real politics, not, oh my God, Twitter mad gay people in games politics. No, 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 like real politics politics, the creation and enforcement of borders, the issue of WMDs for both the big and small factions, the fanaticalization. No! of people forced out by a government they believe don't care about them and the horrible things people will do to that government and its citizens in response. And despite the fact that this game is made by EA, there's some balls to that. Now this campaign still has its very goofy moments and still very campy at times, but the actual thing, the actual entire scale of a political war it's really fascinating, which creates the foundation for this gameplay. And boy, ow, I forgot I had a bruise there. Oh, it's good gameplay. The game 
is fun. So in Tiberium Wars, and if I haven't made this clear, Command Conquer 3 Tiberium Wars is the first game Kane's Wrath is like the expansion of it. But in Tiberium Wars, the original, there were three factions, the GDI, Nod, and Scrin. GDI is the military group of peacekeepers. You, it's really kind of the American military style of group. Their stuff looks generally clean, disciplined and functional. Their units move and speak generally rather professionally, but just have enough personality to stand out. Things like rifleman squads, securing structure, predator tanks, predator ready for battle, look and generally sound the part. But as you go up the tech tree, that personality starts to really make its way out. Things like zone troopers, we got this handled, mammoth tanks, mammoth advancing, commando, he's going dirt tasting, all give GDI a bit more intrigue in their character voicing that has them stand out as, yeah, they're part of the peacekeeper group, but these people have been around. They're allowed to talk a little more loosely because they're veterans. As far as Nod is concerned, despite the whole concept of fanaticalization, all that stuff, Nod is definitely playing the role as the bad guys. And I mean, they're they're terrorists, so it's fair, but their voice lines really show it. Nod is a militant force, and they act like it. Their buildings are a bit more looming. Their presence is a lot more sinister. The way things are curved and sometimes spiked, or like even things like their airfield it doesn't look like a normal airfield. It's like a giant spire in the sky. Their voice acting is impressive. Impeccable, though. And honestly, Nod might be some of the best voice acting in an RTS game I have ever played. I mean, the militant squad alone shows what they're all about. The oppressors must die! Make them suffer! Saboteurs are sinister. <laughs> Attack bikes are just total masochists. Let's go for a hunt! Kill them all! Things like flame tanks have this grueling, brooding nature to them. Cleansing fire. Hell, just that way a flame tank says their own name. Flame tank. Just that venomous delivery is... Oh. This also moves with their tactics and weaponry. You know, GDI feels like it has a pretty standard way of doing its fighting. You've got air support, you've got tanks and infantry, all kinds of stuff. Nod is a little more mischievous. They are a use what's at their disposal. Instead of machine guns and tanks, they have lasers and Tiberium upgraded missiles and flamethrowers. They have a unit called the Reckoner, which is like a suicide truck where you just run it into your opponent's base, you plant it down, it becomes really tanky, and then everything inside just generally burns things to death. Normally, it's with flamethrower guys. The flame tank is a, a tank with flamethrowers. Their big, scary top-level vehicle is called the Avatar, and that thing will kill your other vehicles to gain upgrades. Just rip it up and place something on its shoulder. Oh, God, uh, of course. How could I not forget the literal suicide bomber unit you can build called the Fanatics? They, 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 they have... They have bombs on their chests. They, they, I don't know how more I can describe this. They run with their hands in the air and they go boom and they do a lot of damage. Yeah, I mean, not our good people. They have a lot of personality though. The screen I have less to say about because they're, I mean, well, they're aliens. The idea of them is very alien. They sound alien. Their voice acting is, is actually, or whatever their sound mixing is really good, actually. They all sound genuinely pretty alien. Honestly, the sound design of all their creatures is, is really good. There's a lot of effort put into it. <laughs> they're kind of just an amalgamation of... Uh, well, of everything. There's plenty of alien, as in, you know, alien, alien. You've got some The Day the Earth Stood Still with, like, their buzzer swarms and stuff. you got some Independence Day in there. you got the War of the Worlds tripods. You've got quite a lot of just stuff pulled from other things. But in a weird way, when you pull from so much else, you almost kind of make your own thing. And they feel unique, despite the fact that it's obviously inspired. They also play super alien as well. They utilize Tiberium a lot to either buff their weaponry or it allows them to create create more Tiberium fields, which acts as the game resource. That's pretty important to you. They have things like stasis fields and wormholes and mind control. You know, they're doing all that kind of stuff. Despite that all, though, they still feel familiar to play and pick up and playing them is pretty simple, just like with the other two factions. But then you get to Kane's Wrath. Kane's Wrath decided to expand upon the three rosters. Instead of going from just three factions, you now have nine. However, they're subsections of the original. So you've got still GDI, Nod, and Scrim, but now you have two sub-factions per group. For GDI, we had the Steel Talons and the Zocom. Steel Talons, 
Steel Talons rule. I gotta do it, it's always funny. They're an experimental weapon group that's generally focused around the ground combat and also walkers. They don't really build high level infantry like zone trooper sniper teams. They also don't build like the shatterer tank. However, they make up for it by different kinds of changes to all their other main tanks. Instead of a predator tank, you have the Titan. Instead of well, the shatterer, you have the Wolverine. The Titan is a big walking giant that has a gigantic gun on its side. And the Wolverine is a massive anti-infantry infantry murderer on legs. Their harvesters become heavy harvesters that are tankier and can put infantry inside of it. And their juggernauts, which are these enormous howitzers on legs, now can also fit infantry in them and have a little bit more of an AOE blast. Steel Talons is like that when you really want to just roll over your opponent, utilizing nothing but tons of tanks. You have a, like 20 Titans and you've got some juggernauts or no behemoths in the back, Wolverines driven people apart. AP ammo is insanely powerful and it's just a damn good time. ZOCOM or Zone Operations Command is entirely based around working with, you know, really bad Tiberium fields and stuff. They also really like sonic stuff. Their orcas fire sonic things instead of regular missiles for their aircraft. They have the shatterer, but it's the zone shatterer, so it can fire this big old sonic blast at people. And their zone troopers have become zone raiders, which is exactly where I developed my kink for strong women in big fucking armor. Miss me with that bikini armor shit cringe get me full plate ah! zone raiders are actually really dope instead of zone troopers with their big rail guns they've got aoe sonic blasters and shoulder mounted anti-aircraft missile launchers honestly zocom in general can mass infantry and do a pretty damn good job at it a lot of their infantry have great upgrades that they're allowed with this faction and mobilizing tons of zone raiders those missile troopers and then even some cyber teams here and there throw a commando in there there's a lot of strength in that army or you could fall back on the classic zocom strategy which is a million hammerhead gunships filled with zone raiders it's just everything dies like you can't stop it it is it is insane as for nod you got two factions known as the marked of cain and the black hand the black hand is my favorite faction in all all of command and conquer i fucking love this faction so much if you don't know what the black hand is it's fire fire in everything the black hand is actually a regular unit nod can create which is a group of flamethrower troopers and they're kind of a little heavier a little heavily armored however in this one it doubles up its specialization they completely forego all aircraft no aircraft at all, and they put all their effort directly into flame. Your basic militant group is no longer that. They're called the Confessor Cabal that has mind control grenades, and all of their flame-based things come out promoted, which I haven't talked about yet. In Command and Conquer, the idea of a veteran unit is taken seriously. A unit that has survived a long period of time and killed a lot of things will become promoted. The more promoted you are, the tankier you are, the more powerful you are with your weapons, and if you reach the top, become a heroic unit, you have an increased fire rate and you have health regen. So of the four tiers, regular, promotion one, two, and top heroic, coming out of promotion one naturally is pretty good. Not only that, but you can have an upgrade that adds a black hand flamethrower guy to every infantry squad you make. You just want some regular confessors with their guns, there's a flamethrower guy in there. Missile launchers, there's a flamethrower guy in there. There's a flamethrower guy everywhere. You could upgrade them with blue purifying flame. Do you know the power and the fun of taking two flame tanks with blue flame, bringing it into the back line of your opponent's base and watching it instantly melts every building they've ever had? Hell, their giant walker, the Avatar, it's called the Purifier now. Laser gun, sure. Mounted flamethrower on every single one of them. Oh, you know it. They even have commandos, which we'll talk about in a moment, but they can make two of them. And they both come out at full heroic rank, max rank. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Black Hand is fun. You can literally amass an entire group of infantry, and you don't even need to tech for anti-infantry. Why tech for it? Everyone has a flamethrower. You already have it. Just mow them over in a wash of blue, purifying flame. I mean, come on. I play Sisters of Battle and Warhammer. Is it any surprise I like this? The Marked of Cain, however, bit weirder. They're a little bit more on the cybernetic side of things. We're talking cyborgs. Regular militant squads are, in fact, 
fact, turn into something known as the Awakened. In fact, if you have a bunch of militant squads dying, you could actually have them rise up again from the dead as these Awakened squads. They have Tiberium Troopers, which are a variant of the Flamethrower Black Hand, but they fire liquid Tiberium instead. That's a war crime. They've got tons of EMPs to go around everywhere, and they can upgrade a lot of their laser weaponry with a higher blue tier laser, which on Venom aircraft is... <laughs> Oh my god, spamming blue laser venom aircraft is a strategy I've done quite often. I mean, they're Tiberium-loving techno-fetishists for Nod. It completely parses. Finally, with Skrin, we have Reaper 17 and Traveler 59. Reaper 17 goes hard into Tiberium. They mutilate themselves and they, they screw around with their bodies to add more Tiberium upgrades whenever they can. It's all about increasing the amount of Tiberium, buffing yourself with Tiberium, and having a really strong ground force that just rolls over people. Reaper 17 is a great steamroll faction because they forego their aircraft. And let me tell you, Skrin aircraft are pretty freaking good. So foregoing the air aircraft you better have something good to make up for it and they absolutely do they even have giant green tripods they have this fancy unit called the ravager they're they're a good time i like reaper 17 quite a bit travel 59 is a little bit more weird a little more experimental they go harder into the aircraft they have their little storm riders which are these tiny harassment guys that are pretty good but then you've also got their devastator warships which are insanely long-range artillery platforms and then you've got your planetary assault carriers which are it's a gigantic carrier, and enough of those will kill anything and everything. They also like their mind control. They can make things called cultists, which are just dudes with giant things on their head, and they can mind control enemy units, and... It's a little bullshit, not gonna lie. They have to be in range to mind control, but they have unlimited range past that. Their commando also can AoE mind control and teleport, and can mind control buildings. You can mind control your buddies major construction yard and just sell it after teleporting they're they can be a little dumb i don't know how strong travel 59 are uh in like the meta game but you know some things don't need to be good to be fucking annoying that's traveler 59 so with all these nine factions what does this give us well it gives us an incredibly expansive and impressive rts game with a ton of variety but without ever feeling unfamiliar see despite all these sub factions no one really operates that different from each other it's just like specialization you know look at gdi their harvesters have little anti-infantry guns on their top the steel talons ones are tankier that can put infantry in them and the zocom ones have missiles missiles but they're all still just harvesters they still do the same thing you place down a refinery a harvester gathers tiberium and you get your money certain things like the reaper 17 can help expand their tiberium income and spike the growth of their areas but they still gather it all factions need power all factions have power plants you need to build infantry units are built from the infantry building every faction has an infantry building like this might sound obvious but it's the fact that in a game with nine factions it's so easy to understand exactly what's going on you know what the refineries look like you know which stuff gives what you know what power plants are you know what's important sure black hand might not be building any airfields because they don't have aircraft but Oh, well, I don't need to build anti-aircraft. Good luck still, though. Flamethrower is still about. In fact, I, I think the thing I love the most about Kane's Wrath more than any other RTS game is that it feels like you're you're microing your macro. That's really dumb sounding. That's so stupid. How? Okay, I need to explain this. Strategery. Okay, the game feels more macro heavy than it does micro. If you don't know those terms, micro is the, the high APM, crazy, insane StarCraft player thing, right? Where they're moving Marines back forth, back forth, back forth, and all their units are going tiny little things, you know, micro stuff. Macro is your overall game knowledge and, and like building of resources, tech trees, upgrades, expansions, things that don't involve tiny micro units. However, in StarCraft, a battle crew user you know the biggest most powerful unit in starcraft is built in 160 seconds two and a half minutes a mammoth tank the big scary mammoth tank of the gdi their highest level vehicle takes 25 seconds to build the marv the gigantic vehicle that came out in kane's wrath along with the redeemer and the eradicator hexapod 50 seconds 
double the time, practically a third of the battle cruiser. But at the same time, I feel like the units die at either the same speed or slower than they do in StarCraft. But your resource deposits also go away much faster. Also, when you spend resources, you don't need to hit thresholds like you do in StarCraft. You don't need to have 50 minerals to create a Terran Marine. You just need to have anything in the queue and then as time goes it'll slowly be built if you're building a mammoth tank and you run out of money the production queue just halts and it waits to get money again then it continues so with production so fast with units dying the same speed or slower than starcraft with tiberium getting removed faster which means you need to expand more and the actual build queues that are going on without needing to wait for a threshold and fighting over all of the neutral buildings like tiberium spikes on the map i feel like i'm microing my macro does it make any sense like in starcraft right a standard terran marine can basically kill anything with enough volume or enough time hell a crap load of terran marines is a major strategy in starcraft because you put them somewhere and they'll kill anything in command and conquer some fights just won't go anywhere a predator tank versus rifleman squad tank isn't built for this squad it'll kill them before the rifleman squad does because the rifleman squad does no damage against tanks but it'll take forever so having the right tool for the job is important but it doesn't mean there's no micro either one you can make formations which is the coolest thing ever but also you can tell them to move backwards you can have them reverse pit bulls can move backwards and fire rockets at aircraft chasing them down this is an option this is an opportunity that tank may not be able to kill that rifleman squad but it can run it over and so when your opponent sees tanks coming towards his guys he better get them out of the way or they're just gonna crush them certain infantry though like zone troopers can't be crushed at least not by small things hell production times are so fast that even if you lose a massive fight it's not gg that's the one thing that i always feel with like with starcraft is the the moment I lose a major fight, like the big, the big battle, then I have nothing at my base. My production times all take too long. I've lost the game. It's, it's literally over. In Command and Conquer, if you lose the big fight with your opponent, you're still building. In fact, you can even build base defenses as a major part of it. Anti-infantry, anti-tank, or the really big one, the sonic emitter, or the, the very popular one, the obelisk of light, which is such a badass building so despite the fact that your opponent may have won this major fight you're pumping out infantry you're pumping out base defenses you're pumping out stuff it's not about just winning the fight and you've won you need to follow up if you spent so much time microwing your units and trying to get rid of your opponent's big army and you've neglected your base you might not be able to finish the job and because you've neglected your production cues guess what you're on even footing again that win meant nothing it just makes the game feel like it's never over until it it's over. Resources don't completely deplete. They regrow over time slowly, but they do it. Harassment techniques like killing harvesters is a popular option, but harvesters can always be rebuilt. Buildings that have been damaged can be repaired just by clicking a button, but it costs you money to repair things. Hell, the use of multiple strike avenues, I feel like is such an important part of Command and Conquer because you can have your big force, right? Your infantry, your tanks, your walkers, all the big stuff, and you just move that force into your opponent, the big fighting force, you know? classic ground war but why have just this big frontline force without some aircraft support hell get some firehawk gunships and send them around the corner to bomb some of their important buildings maybe like a power plant or something if you're out of power you don't get a mini map if you're out of power your base defense is shut down so now you've got this giant front force and then you've got aircraft but what about more? What about some harassment techniques? Go kill their harvesters. You got this big battle in the front, micro some units in the back, throw flame tanks in there to burn their refineries up, send maybe even an engineer to steal one if you can get away with it. Bring in attack bikes because attack bikes are so annoying and use them to kill all their harvesters off. So even if they do win the fight, you've killed their economy. So now you've got big front force aircraft harassment. Why not that cherry on the Sunday? Bring in your commando. There's an old saying, the deadliest weapon in the world is a Marine and his rifle. Commando is the embodiment of that saying. A commando is very small, 
not too squishy, but squishy enough. But he shreds infantry. He just mows them down at 1200 RPM and no infantry can stand a chance against him. But he can die pretty quickly to maybe some aircraft or something if he's out of position. That's why he's small. However, if he reaches a building, well, a one commando can destroy an entire base. Once he's in there, once he's in and sabotaging your stuff and planting his bombs, one commando can destroy your entire base and ruin everything for you. Once you hear that, that beautiful and everything just explodes, then there's problems. The game will even tell you enemy commando detected to make it very clear that there's someone there. So frontline force, aircraft support, harvester harassment, and a commando in their back lines blowing their shit up. And you're telling me this isn't one of the best RTSs ever made. It's so much fucking fun. And then you have all the support powers on the side of your screen, things like anti-aircraft and orbital strikes. And you've got like Tiberium catalyst missiles and radar jammers and, and and you can spawn a mothership. And oh, let's not even forget to talk about the super weapons, ion cannons, nuclear missiles, a black hole, all this shit coming together in a crazy amount of fun, an awesome game. And EA decided to tear it to the ground and completely stop making any of this shit. And the RTS genre is dead. Red Alert 3, if I'm not mistaken, is, is not running wonderful on PC. I think it's got problems with matchmaking or if there even is any. And then the game after Kane's Wrath, Command and Conquer 4, Tiberium Twilight, and it fucking sucked. It was some of the worst RTSs I've ever played. It was genuinely terrible. And I think this is like a good metric of the slow decline of EA's quality. Kane's Wrath right now, it, it works. You can play with people. It's in 30 FPS, unfortunately, which really sucks. But an HD remake with 60 frames per second? Throw that thing on PC again? Just EA, I know you're lazy. I know you guys want the lowest amount of effort possible. Just update that. Just, I don't care. I want this back in the world so I can watch more tournaments and stuff. In fact, there's still some of that going on right now. There is a channel I've been watching a lot lately for this video. It's called Cybert CNC Caster. He casts pro Command and Conquer Kane's Wrath games as well as some Red Alert stuff, but the Kane's Wrath stuff is immaculate. It is so entertaining to watch and it's so exciting. And the thought that this could come back is just I know it won't because of course it won't and I'm just a guy. Oh my God, it's so entertaining. It's so good. It's so good to watch. I'll leave his channel in the description. Check it out. It's true peak Command and Conquer content. So much love in this game. So much polish, so much care put into it. I didn't even mention the 4X mode. There's a mode like Global Conquest where you have like a 4X elements and then you do the fight. Like they, it's just there. It's so good. I've made myself sad. Hopefully one day we'll make our way back. Until then, we got to deal with... What was that mobile game they made? Oh, God. Kane's Wrath. I think you need to buy Tiberium Wars first and then buy the expansion if you want to play it on Steam. I don't want people to buy it because, you know, EA, but it's such an enjoyable experience. Oh, it's so much fun. I'm torn. Cognitive dissonance is holding two opposing ideals simultaneously. My ideals, giving EA money, more people playing Command and Conquer. I can't, I can't parse. It was a, a cornerstone of my middle school and high school time and I absolutely love it and i wanted to gush about it and i goddamn did it and i'm proud of it and that's it for me thank you so much for watching thank you to my beautiful patrons over at patreon.com slash bricky you are immaculate people really helping me out love seeing it and let me read a couple of your questions now i'm sure they're just gonna be dumb are you from the gunnery decks oh, that's good okay i like that one why is california the worst state you really gonna say this when liquid exists if you ain't from the gas gang you ain't packing heat dog i hate this fucking channel uh next video will be a destiny witch queen review stay tuned come on obviously you're a skater <laughs>